Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're coming to you live from the World Economic Forum's India Economic Summit here in New Delhi. Joining us today is a power-packed panel to talk about the manufacturing agenda. It is a crucial engine to drive and fuel growth for India. Lots has been done, but what more needs to be done to ensure that we actually achieve the potential? Remember, manufacturing has been identified as a priority area by the Modi government. The Make in India mission has been successful in that it has positioned India as a manufacturing hub. But all of that now needs to translate into investments, growth, opportunities and jobs. What more can be done to truly make India a center of the global manufacturing supply chain? Those are some of the issues that we intend to discuss here today. Very brief introductions because my panelists here today don't really need any. Let me start with my right, the man who is the man behind Make in India, Amitabh Kant, the CEO of the Niti Aayog. Appreciate you joining us on the show. Also with us, Sanjeev Sharma, uh, the man who's responsible for ABB's operations in India. Sanjeev, appreciate you joining us. John Oric of AT Kani, looking at the manufacturing sector and looking at India very, very closely. And a veteran of India's manufacturing industry, Baba Kalyani, the chairman of the Kalyani Group. Appreciate you joining us here on the show. Mr. Kant, let me start by asking you. And let me list out everything that has been done. Uh, Mr. Kalyani pointed out that the Make in India brand is perhaps one of the most successful brands that the Indian government has created. But to make that brand now convert itself into opportunities, convert itself into investments, what more? needs to be done. Shireen, uh, firstly, you know, we made ourselves a very complicated and difficult place to do business. You've got to make yourself the easiest and the simplest place to do business in. We've opened up our economy in a very big way. Uh, we've, our FD has grown by about 53%. Globally, it's down by 16%. But I think we need to drive innovation in a much bigger way. Uh, we've seen a lot of innovation happening in the field of uh, automobiles, auto components, etc. We need to push the limits in defense manufacturing in a very big way. It'll be, you know, you want to grow at 9 to 10 percent uh, on a sustained basis over a long period of time, you need to create jobs. And it's very important that electronics, uh, hardware manufacturing, defense manufacturing must become the key driver for making manufacturing grow at very, very rapid pace. It's, it's important that, you know, you can't have growth without jobs. Mm -hmm. Jobs is a critical factor only manufacturing can give you jobs and therefore to my mind opening up the envelope in these sectors is very critical orders must flow out they must flow into uh, into do into domestic manufacturing areas you're absolutely right and job creation is going to be a significant challenge in fact if you look at the latest data that's coming from the government the unemployment rate is at five percent up from 4.9 percent in 2014 so that is going to be a critical aspect that we will need to contend with but let me ask you specifically sir uh, you know Make in India is not just about manufacturing in India, because if you look at the defense procurement policy that the government has recently released, the idea really is to design, develop, and make in India. Mm. With that emphasis, do you believe that we really move up the value addition uh, curve as far as manufacturing is concerned? No, uh, Shireen, actually a lot of innovation is taking place. You know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a story not talked about, but over the last uh, four years, there are 1,500 uh, multinational corporations who've relocated their manufacturing, who've relocated their global innovation centers into Bangalore and Hyderabad. Actually, India is innovating for the rest of the world in many ways. Microsoft's Bing, uh, you know, uh, you look at uh, John Decree's 60 HP uh, tractor, you look at uh, uh, several innovations done for Honeywell, mm. uh, for several companies across the world has actually been innovated in India. Uh, look at a company like Renault in its 118 years history. It's never innovated, designed, manufactured a car outside Europe. It comes and does that in Chennai, Renault Quid, which is exporting to the rest of the world. Uh, so a lot of innovation is happening here. We need to push the limits from not merely auto components and automobile, but into a vast range of new areas of manufacturing now. Okay, uh, Sanjeev, let me put that question to you then. When we talk about these new areas and pushing the boundaries and pushing the envelope now, and ABB has a 100-year history in India, so across your various businesses, you have been not just manufacturing in India, but you've also been designing and developing in India uh, through your R&D centers. What more needs to be done to make this manufacturing story real? I mean, I've heard about this figure of manufacturing output being 25% of GDP uh, for many, many years. The target is getting there by 2020. How realistic is that today? I think in, a, in today's uh, connected world and the technology absorption which is taking place and I think India is one 
country wherein the technology absorption is at a very, very good pace. And uh, so I would say uh, the next uh, revolution that we are going to see in the industry side, uh, Industry 4, mm. uh, I think it has all the imprints uh, that it can happen in India. Because what it actually is, looks for is, it looks for uh, you know, the uh, interconnected processes. You have high-end uh, software development, uh, which is connecting the manufacturing processes. So I think many of the elements exist within the, within the country. And there is a cutting edge uh, you know, uh, supply of R&D towards the global corporation, which is done in places like Bangalore, et cetera. If you put all these things together, I think we already have a fairly robust uh, uh, ecosystem combined with the demographic dividend uh, that, that stays with us. Well, let me ask you this, and then, and then I'll put this question to Mr. Kalyani and John as well. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation with the GE Vice Chairman John Rice, and GE has been a long-term India investor as well. Uh, but, the, you know, companies still believe that the cost of doing business is intimidating or continues to be intimidating in India. Do you agree with that? Have you seen any significant difference? Uh, well, I, I like to look at the, uh, the positive side of the story, <coughs> wherein if I see that now we are becoming a demand-driven, uh, you know, supply chain. Like, if you really look into our daily lives, uh, if you want to order a device or some good that you want to consume in your house, you can order it online, and then there's a whole supply chain behind it, which is able to deliver it, despite all the constraints we talk about, the uh, sure. infrastructure and others. Uh, you know, the ecosystem is able to absorb uh, that kind of innovation and technologies, and, and the service quality is improving day by the day. So I believe, yes, we, we do have the, the base to leverage on. Yeah. Okay, we have the base to leverage on. Mr. Kalyani, let me ask you this. Uh, and, you know, just picking up from, from where I left the conversation with Sanjeev, uh, and John Rice, who's a co-chair here at the World Economic Forum's India Economic Summit, also said that if India really wants to position itself as an exporting hub, if it wants to do more of making India for the world, then it needs to start to provide uh, better facilities to exporters as well. Maybe some export-linked incentives. What, to your mind, should be the prescription if India wants to position itself as the next big export hub? You know, uh, uh, my view on uh, Indian manufacturing and specifically for exports, uh, as a company, 70% of our revenue is exports. So, you know, we've been doing it for many, many <coughs> years. Uh, let me just state uh, a few of the uh, uh, important facts uh, as they stand today. Uh, if you look at manufacturing of engineered products, I think uh, there is hardly a place that is more competitive in the world than India. Uh, you have uh, the skill sets which uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan just mentioned in terms of, you know, people doing R&D and research mm -hmm. and uh, designing for all large companies. I mean, there's, there's a whole pool of people and ecosystem uh, that's all present there. You have raw material costs which are almost the same as the rest of the world. Sure. Uh, we have some amount of disadvantage in terms of our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, the infrastructure that you use in manufacturing, but that uh, I think with whatever the government is trying to do, hopefully we see light at the end of the tunnel uh, going forward. So I don't think, uh, I personally don't think you need incentives for exports. Okay. Okay. I think we are a competitive economy as far as exports are concerned. The problem in exports is that uh, you have a fairly volatile global, global marketplace. Yes. You have a lot of capacities uh, <coughs> in place. You have labor unions in other countries which exert pressures uh, within the system. You have social problems uh, that come out of all this. So those are, those are external issues. I think, uh, so therefore, I, I honestly don't think this is a challenge uh, for us uh, to export. I think the real challenge for us is how do we substitute import in India mm. with Indian products, which is mm. what uh, Amitabh just talked about, you know, defense. I mean, there's a huge amount of imports that are taking place. Mm. And that's only going to keep growing. I mean, it's going to keep growing exponentially but unless on, we do something about it. On defense, let me ask you this. And we have seen significant changes as far as the FDI policy is concerned. There is virtually no cap now for FDI in defense because you can go all the way up to 100%. Uh, the conditionalities or the caveats have also, in that sense, been altered. But do you really see 
uh, a big ticket uh, inflow of FDI into the defense space? Because let's be clear, it also requires assured orders and here it's the government that is the procurer. I mean, okay, uh, I, I don't want to contradict what you're saying, but you know, it's not necessary that only the foreigners have to come here and make defense products. No, I'm not okay. suggesting that. I'm, I'm just <laughs> saying that the government has, has liberalized <laughs> the sector significantly. Okay. FDI in the automotive sector and automotive component sector was liberalized 20 years ago. You know, there's 100% FDI in the automotive sector and the automotive component sector. Who are the winners in this game? Mm -hmm. Are there foreign companies who are the winners? Or are there Indian companies who are the winners? You know, the answer is clear. Yeah, but they, a, lot, a lot of those companies did start off as joint ventures, etc. Not necessarily. You know, so FDI is a good thing because you need investments, you need technology. So, you know, we all welcome this. And uh, we ourselves have joint ventures with half a dozen companies. But at the end of the day, we have to create uh, the ecosystem to mm. manufacture products within the country. So how real is this? Are we talking five years down the line? Are we talking about 10 years down the line? Because, you know, everyone's talking about making India and defense as being the next big opportunity. But give me a reality check of when you truly believe we are going to be able to see the fruits of that. I think between six to 12 months. Six to 12 months? Yes. Making India and defense will yes. be a reality in the next six, six to 12, to 12 months. months. Okay, I'll, I'll get Mr. Khan to comment on that in just a second. But John, uh, let me ask you this, because you know, there's clearly optimism here uh, amongst our panelists about the strength of the Indian manufacturing story, of the strength of domestic story, and that is giving investors like them confidence. But as you look at India today, and yes, we've done all of this stuff, uh, ease of doing business, competitiveness, ranking has improved. What continue to be the bugbears that you would like addressed? You would like a reality check? For yes. Me. <laughs> well, first, uh, uh, a prefix. Uh, I've been coming for many years to India, and the promise of India has always been there. And I must really say, I've, I've never been more optimistic about India than now. It's really the case. Um, both talking to, not so only talking to government officials, but particularly talking to the business world. The trust. Um, is really risen in a remarkable way. Uh, and so that's fantastic. That's something to build on. Um, so I, I remain a big time optimist on India. Mm -hmm. So now let's bring <laughs> down, uh, down to reality a bit. Um, the promise of, uh, of Make India was uh, not only the 25% of GDP uh, sure. target, but particularly 100 million uh, jobs. Yes. Uh, and that, that particularly from, from a government point of view, that's your prime responsibility after mm. all. Um, and the hope was, I suppose, uh, to uh, do what China has been doing so, so successfully. China lifted 400 million people out of poverty uh, based on a model of low labor costs mm -hmm. and of export-based manufacturing. That was their model. They're changing that model right now. And that's the reason that the growth rate has gone down so much. Uh, I'm quite certain that they will make a lot of progress on that way. But I do believe that India cannot imitate that model. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is, I think, naive to do that because the world has changed in the meantime. Yes. At least two things I would like to mention. Uh, one is the world is not growing that much anymore. Right. Look around you. It's, it's, it's mediocre growth at best um, and sometimes very, very low. And, and so to build your hopes only on exports is, I think, naive mm -hmm. is maybe the word. Uh, instead of make, in, in, uh, make for the world, I would focus on make for India, India in the yes. first place. Uh, this is a country of huge potential and, uh, and, and uh, the India market is bigger than most people seem to realize, I think. So that's number one. And number two is technology has changed. When Make India was designed, which I think was, was five, six years ago, the first studies, uh, since now, um, the technological developments have been huge. Mm. Robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, right. uh, IoT, you name it, I can give you a long list. And all of them uh, have an enormous impact, certainly on the manufacturing uh, world. Um, you cannot base manufacturing, uh, successful manufacturing for the long term, only on low labor cost. You have to become uh, technologically advanced and, and, and implement that. So those are challenges, certainly for this country. Yes, uh, so let me address uh, one of those challenges with you, Mr. Kant, and we've had this conversation in the past. Uh, you know, as John rightfully said, that part of making India is creating jobs in India. Uh, 
At this point in time, we're not really seeing that happen. At this point in time, we're also faced with a situation where jobs are getting added. For instance, in the auto sector, which is now seeing a demand revival, uh, in the last year, 13,000 jobs were added, but 70% of those 13,000 jobs were contract labor. It was not permanent workforce. Uh, so given that challenge, what is the prescription then on the kinds of sectors that the government will need to put its might and its money, perhaps, behind? Uh, what are the kind of sectors that you will need to push to be able to achieve this objective? So let me first say that I don't agree with Auric at all. Uh, nobody, nobody makes for only the domestic market. And India must start thinking big in size and scale. Did Japan grow by manufacturing for its domestic market? Did Korea do that? Did China do that? You use the domestic manufacturing base as a springboard for exports. India's share of the global export market is very minimal. Yes. It's just 1.6%. Every crisis is an opportunity. India, Indian entrepreneurs, Indian manufacturers must think large in size and scale. They must penetrate global markets. If in, you, India can't grow at 9 to 10% without exports, no country in the world has grown without exports. You must look at domestic markets, but you get 10x the value in the export market. In the long term, Indians must be absolutely clear in the market that don't go by advice of consultants <laughs> and, 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 and Indians must go and penetrate global markets. That ambition and hunger for penetrating global markets. Without that, India just no, can't no, do it. I, I'm liking this, uh, this, yeah. this repartee, so let me, let me get John to respond to that. John, we don't need consultants like you. <laughs> oh, this, this is fantastic. This is beginning to look like the presidential elections in the United States. <laughs> Who are you, Clinton um, or Trump? Uh, al although I would suggest, with your agreement, we will not sink to that level, sh 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 shall, well, shall we? You, you can uh, be the Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Does he, does he have uh, presidential temperament or not, uh, uh, John? It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, 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 uh, I, ki I kindly take that challenge. My point was, you cannot only base uh, Make India on an export-led, low labor cost environment. You cannot only do that. Because that is what China did successfully, and you need to be smarter about that. So you also need to look at the domestic market, which is incredibly attractive. Why are so many? Why is FDI <coughs> increasing so much uh, in India? Because a lot of foreign companies see the potential of yeah. the Indian market, which is tremendous. So absolutely, India companies need to be champions worldwide. I would, I would always advise them to do that. But I would also advise them not to forget this market. Um, and th th I don't always see that, let me put it that way. The second thing is much more important, <coughs> is that the key thing uh, is to become really technologically advanced, to use the technological advancement uh, that there is in order uh, to become successful. Mm -hmm. And if I may add that, that, that is not an easy task. No. It's not a matter of having a beautiful plant where within the four walls of the plant everything is optimal. That is only one very small uh, part of an overall system. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing is a system. It, it's, it's from planning, designing, buying, delivery, and that whole system needs to, needs to work well. And in that sense, there are still a lot of challenges also in this country uh, to, uh, to be made, as we all know. Uh, just try to go from A to B, mm -hmm. and then you get your answer. Now, I am a firm believer that major progress is made. GST was a miracle, I think, honestly. Well, it hasn't played uh, out yet. Okay, yeah. but the first step, it still is a miracle. In it my is, view. it is. And, um, but all the infrastructure, and infrastructure in the broader sense, there still is tremendous progress to be made. You will only become truly excellent, both as an exporter and, and uh, for the Indian market, if that whole system becomes truly excellent. That is the challenge I have. Mr. Kalyani, you're nodding, so before I come toss it back to Mr. Kant, you want to add to what John is saying, and then I'll get Mr. Kant to respond. Well, let me give another perspective, okay? Uh, a country in the manufacturing space is known by brands that it's selling to the rest of the world, yes. you know? Germany is known by its Audis and Mercedes and, and BMWs. Uh, BMWs and, you know, Japan is known by uh, something else. You know, we all took China uh, initially 20 years ago uh, for granted uh, and poo-pooed them because they were selling only toys, but today every no. smartphone is, is <coughs> made out of China. Now, uh, what is the brand that India has that, uh, you know, we have three brands as I see it. We have, the, our biggest brand is Make in India. You go anywhere in the world, people know about Make in India. 
and what it means. Our second biggest brand is probably yoga. And our third biggest brand is spices. Mm. Okay, that's where it stops. And, you know, I think what Amitabh is saying and what I, I would like to say is Indian companies need to create products that are recognized in the world. And therefore, you know, how do you become a nation known for manufacturing if you don't make products that are well known in the world? Yeah. So I think that's important. And you believe that we don't, we don't have any uh, brands or world-class standards at this point in time? or You, you tell me one. <coughs> Tata's? Mahindra's? Good brands, yes. Bajaj, Kalyani. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Kant, you want to respond to that and then I'm going to throw it open to the, uh, to the audience no, for my, questions. Uh, you know, we've opened up India's economy. We've allowed FDI to come in across sectors. The objective was to allow technology and competition to come in, innovation to happen. Uh, my point was simply that nobody comes in looking only at the domestic market. You know, I mean, look at the example of Hyundai when it came in. It came in looking for the domestic market. But it is today exporting 50% of its production to 123 countries using India as its manufacturing base. Uh, look at Suzuki. It started exporting to its own uh, yeah, Japan. country, Japan, back. So everybody starts looking at the domestic market, but it uses that as a base for exports across the world. And Indians are entrepreneurial in nature. India's entrepreneurship is top class. I mean, it's unbelievable. And look at the kind of startups these guys are doing. And you just allow them the freedom to fly and think big and large. You know, the, we need to do something about our labor laws. I mean, if, at least the states need to do this because unless you do things to size and scale, you want to penetrate markets, you need to do it on large size and scale. And therefore, factor market productivity is the key. You need to make India a far more efficient economy. At the peak of its growth, uh, Japan was growing with eff efficiency, was counting for 31% of, of its growth. Uh, Korea's in factor market productivity was counting for 42% of its growth. In China, it was accounting for 79%. We need to make India a far more efficient economy by bringing in factor market reforms now. We've done major reforms. We've brought in now structural reforms through uh, bankruptcy laws, national company law tribunal, GST. All these are very radical reforms which this government has brought in. We were talking about them for last 10 years. We've, this government has done it. Now we need to push the limits in factor market reforms. So and when, that's land when, and labor. When, when do we see that happen? I think the states will have to take the lead. The states must become the key agents of change now. You need 12 champion states to make India grow at 9 to 10% on a consistent basis. The hunger and ambition for 12% growth in states. 12 states growing at that level and it's doable in India, I can assure you. The leadership is dramatically changing in India today. There's huge competition among states. States are becoming, I'm seeing this one, the competition <coughs> on ease of doing business. The kind of competition that is taking place. Every chief minister is calling a meeting every week to make itself easy and simple. And therefore, my belief is that the, the political leadership is driving growth today. There's huge determination. We just need to drive it, accelerate it even more. OK, that's a good point. Uh, Sanjeev, you want to add to that uh, very quickly before I get the uh, I, I fully agree with from the Mr. audience. Yes. Uh, point of view. I think even as a, as a multinational company which is operating and manufacturing in this country for the last 60 years, now my mandate uh, running this company here in India is twofold from the group headquarters. Number one, ABB for India and ABB for the world. So it's, a, it's not one or the other, it's a combination of the two because the kind of a leverage which is available out of this country. And the second point which uh, Mr. Khan mentioned about the states, I, I live out of Bangalore and in last one month, I at least had three chief ministers of different states who visited uh, Bangalore from, with their complete uh, administration and invited us to have a dialogue with them and also really made a very, very good case in terms of why we should set up our manufacturing okay. and services operation in this So way. competitive so federalism is working to the advantage of industry at this point in time. At least, at least it's visible to us. It, it, at least it's visible. So let me throw this open for questions now. Uh, Mr. Goenka, I'm going to get a microphone across <coughs> to you, sir. If you can just stand up so that it's easier for them to, to spot you. Pavan Goenka there of uh, M&M. Yes, sir. Thank right. you. 
Uh, just to add to the last point that I fully agree that the states have become very competitive and hungry for business. And they don't only invite us when they come to a town, they come to our offices to meet us. So that's a very big difference. Uh, there are many points that uh, I, would, I could talk about, but there's one point that I would like to press on further on what was discussed on export. Uh, I agree with Baba that we don't need uh, incentives for export, but there are two points that I think we still need. One is uh, bilateral agreements mm -hmm. that many countries have, which puts us at a disadvantage when we're exporting, because import duty that we have to pay is higher right. than many other countries that have bilaterals, and especially for auto OEMs, that becomes a major disadvantage. Sure. And second one, you, you talked about brand, uh, which is very important, and brand of a product uh, sort of follows brand of the country. Mm. Uh, and therefore, to, for India to establish a brand, not so much for B2B, because B2B brand requirements are very different than B2C brand requirements. Right. So <coughs> while a manufactured car from Suzuki uh, may be seen as a Suzuki car and not as an Indian car, a car manufactured by Tata or Mahindra is seen as an Indian car. Mm. So how do we do more of brand development of Indian manufactured goods for consumer? But isn't that, not for isn't that your job, sir? No, it is a combined effort that Government of India and the industry has to put in. Just like Incredible India campaign that was done, I think Amitav started that many years okay. ago, which okay. worked very well. Okay. Similarly, we have to do a campaign for manufactured goods from India to develop India brand. Okay, so two points there, and let me address uh, both. John, I want to start by asking you about the second point. Uh, you know, how much of it is a collaboration between the country as well as the company, so to speak, to try and uh, uh, take forward this idea of making India and make in India brands? It, it absolutely takes two to tango. Uh, it, it's a country slash state effort, a government, a government effort, wherever the government sits, and it's a company effort, both, uh, both uh, to do that. The, you mentioned uh, uh, several German uh, mm. brands like Audi and BMW and what have you. Uh, what's so wonderful and why those brands are so strong uh, and why they get such a big premium is because it's reinforced by the country brand. Mm. Uh, the country brand for quality, whether justified or not, but that brand, which everyone believes and trusts, is linked with uh, the company uh, brand. And that has been built over decades, uh, by the way. Brand is built on trust, sure. and trust is built in very small steps over many, many years. It takes a long time. The wonderful thing is, once it's there, it's very solid, mm. uh, as long as you don't. Mess around uh, with it. <laughs> mess around with it, exactly. Um, but that is, what, that is what's required. Um, so, and I, 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 I actually, I like your challenge. Uh, show me the, the big brands around the world. If you go to any city in Detroit and you ask people to give an Indian brand, I think you will get no answer. Yes. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, but you get no answer. Well, it's, it's, it behooves you to think about that, I think. A absolutely, but it's also a chicken and egg. I mean, it is, you know, are Indian brands going to take the Make in India brand forward? Did yeah. Germany take Audi and BMW forward, or did BMW and Audi, through consistent well, leadership, it was a take bit of the Germany? Yes, yeah, a little a bit, bit of both. both frankly, sure. and it requires a dialogue. Yes. Okay, let me move to the second point and I'll, I'll, I'll come to more questions in just a second. Mr. Kalyani, on the second issue of uh, inking bilateral trades, and we're now seeing an increasing trend of protectionism. We're also seeing partnerships, uh, you know, like the TPP. We don't know what is going to come off it eventually now because the U.S. itself seems to be developing cold feet. Uh, multilateral arrangements seem to be less relevant today. It is going to be more about bilateral agreements. Uh, in that context, how critical is it going to be for the government to step the efforts and the pressure up to do something? I think it's absolutely important. I think Pawan uh, raised a very, very important issue. Uh, we are beginning to see headwinds that were not there before uh, in terms of uh, goods flowing out of India to many destinations. And I think this is largely because uh, you had a platform with uh, multilateral agreements uh, with uh, the World Trade Organization yeah. and all those kinds of things and that's kind of broken down mm. and has become now uh, bilateral yes. arrangements. And bilateral arrangements, everybody does it for their own advantage. Nobody's yes. going to do it for your advantage. Sure. So I think, uh, uh, but, but I must say this, that uh, I think our government is also seized of this issue. It's not mm. that uh, it's off the radar, mm. uh, it's seized of the issue. Uh, maybe uh, we've been busy uh, doing a lot of other things uh, which were absolutely necessary yes. because you had to create confidence uh, mm. in the Indian economy, you had to create confidence in the Indian policy uh, sure. that's been put forward and I think uh, I'm sure this issue 
uh, will get addressed. But I think we as industry and of mm. course uh, from the government side, we need to together really push this agenda. A quick comment from you, Mr. Kant, before I get in more questions. And, you know, one can blame the decline in exports, which we've seen consistently now for the last 18, 19 months, on a weak global environment. But outside of that, isn't it time really for India to also introspect and see what more needs to be done in terms of bilateral agreements, in terms of new markets to enter, and so on and so forth? No, I'm a great believer in bilateral agreements. I think we should be far more aggressive. Our Commerce Ministry is working on that. It's important that we work with uh, Europe to enable our uh, compact cars and our textiles to penetrate uh, European markets. We need to be uh, working, uh, we need to push the limits in RCEP, etc. But I think a lot of work is being done by Commerce Ministry and okay. uh, they are pursuing it in the right direction. So I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, we need to become a far more aggressive player in the external environment. Okay, more questions. Yes, sir, if you can raise your hand and just stand up, please. I'll get uh, gentleman right behind. I'll come back to you, sir, in just a second. My name is R. Suresh. I work for a Japanese company in the executive search business, but we serve manufacturing groups, both Indian and, Jap and Japanese predominantly. My question is for Mr. Kalyani. You talked about competitiveness. India is as competitive as any other country in manufacturing because you touched upon labor cost and skills and cost of material and so on. My question to you, uh, Mr. Kalyani and, and, and others as well, is how competitive are we on use of advanced technologies in manufacturing. Because if you compare with China and India, yeah. I, we understand robotics, automation, and now 3D printing right. is getting far more deeper into the in, in, integration of manufacturing. Okay. Is 3D printing particularly a, a going to be uh, so as, we, as we talk about, uh, you know, as the gentleman is saying, as we talk about companies uh, sort of pivoting towards becoming digital industrial companies, where does India stand? How competitive are we? You know, <clears throat> first of all, uh, the basic answer is we are as competitive as anybody else in using technology. Uh, I think, you know, Indians, Indian engineers, Indian entrepreneurs, Indian managers are as good as anywhere else in the world. So we're pretty good at using technology. The problem in using technology on a large scale is it is connected with demand. And unless you drive demand in that direction, you know, uh, you can't use technology. I mean, you talked about 3D printing. I mean, there are thousands of Chinese companies who are 3D printing Indian gods and sending it here. <laughs> we, we have more than a thousand gods, so yes. <laughs> so, you know, you're beginning to see this demand come because this is disruptive processes. You very soon see a thousand Indian companies doing the same thing. No, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not going to take a long time. So it's going to happen. Yes, more questions. Yes, sir, if you can stand up, please, and we'll get the microphone across to you. And then since most of the questions are coming in from this side of the room, if there's questions from behind me, I'll come back to you. Yes. Mr. Kumar, uh, you talked about yoga and, uh, of course, you know, the other things that you talked about India. Probably one of the things that we may want to think about is Ayurveda. And, and herbal, you know, plants, medicine. So India is known for Ayurveda. And one of the aspirations of Amitabh and the leadership of India today has this about taking Ayurveda to the world. Mm. India doesn't have enough land to cultivate organic herbal plants. Other parts of the world has. If uh, Israel could take uh, irrigation and make oranges and apples and irrigation as their core, uh, you know, brand of Israel, why can't India look at taking Ayurveda in a big way to the rest of the world? You have insights on this. You did incredible India. Can you take Ayurveda no, I think to the world? My experience of Ayurveda comes from uh, Kerala, where I did God's Own Country, and I think there's huge potential in that. And well, wellness has a huge potential. You know, people like Aurek are so stressed out that uh, you need stress bust. <laughs> you need you need you need uh, Ayurveda as a stress buster for the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, this is your Donald Trump moment, is it? <laughs> okay, uh, the, the lady there at the back, can we, can we get a question in from you, please? So, um, I would like to pose, uh, I, I like that uh, the panel is very optimistic about manufacturing and exports in India, but I'm in the garment manufacturing field. And honestly, uh, our future, to me, looks very bleak. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, China grew because they built cities around garment manufacturing. And I think like countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and even Vietnam have overtaken India in the garment manufacturing yes. um, you know, field. And uh, 
I'd like your opinion on this because I think that we employ together garment manufacturers, I mm. think the most number of people in this country. And I don't really see without the drawback that we get from the government, our yes. existence. So, okay. And, and that is a very, very valid point that you make. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, the government is quite, uh, was quite seized with the matter and we've just announced a very major uh, uh, textile package for the entire industry. Uh, we don't have to uh, uh, imitate China and everything, but ch in China, wages are rising at the level of about 12 to 13 percent per annum. And uh, China is going to become extremely competitive as far as textiles and garments are concerned. Uh, it's important that India seizes this opportunity. And therefore, we looked at the entire textile industry. We've, the government has announced, because it's a very labor-intensive industry, and you can create vast number of jobs. No, but is this 6,000 crore rupee package that was announced yeah. enough? Uh, well, you know, I think uh, it's the right step forward. I, to my mind, it's quite adequate at the moment. So it'll, it's uh, a push in the right direction, uh, at least. But if there's more to do, the government will be very happy to examine this. We are very keen to drive uh, uh, textiles and uh, garments in a, in a very big way. One of the constraints, of course, uh, as far as uh, garments are concerned, is the not having a bilateral uh, trade treaty with Europe. Yeah. And uh, that is putting Bangladesh to an advantage of about 9%. So you need to push that. Uh, I, you know, so, uh, but otherwise, we are very open. We've pushed a very big package for textile industry. We are willing to do much more. Uh, if there's anything, just put it in writing and give it to me. A very quick response, and then I'll get more questions. Well, in. Also, I would like to, you know, to touch on, it's not just the package of the money we're receiving, right? But it's uh, technology in terms yeah. of, we shut down Thirupur, right? We shut yeah. down all those mills. We're shutting down mills every day because of pollution, but then there's no answer. There are so many people that are making fabric in, in a right way, using the right STP plants, making sure there's zero discharge, but they're still being shut down. But what's the answer to coupling technology as we're talking about in all different yeah. kinds of manufacturing? Sure. In garments, technology is very expensive. It's as much no, as- No, I'll be very happy to machine, sit down right? and interact with you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. More questions? Uh, yes, so go ahead. Uh, if you can get a microphone. You have one already. Okay, Mr. Bajaj, go ahead and I'll come to you in just a second. Indian waiting for jobs in the next 10 years. Amitabh, your Made in India program is directly correlated with absorbing these uh, labor market people. Have you done any calculations as to how many of them will be absorbed? Because I believe, I'm very worried, that if these youth which come into the labor market are not absorbed, we are going to have serious anti-social problems. Yeah, that's I'm very, a, very serious. It's a valid point, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. So, you know, no, that's a very important point that has been made, and that's why the, there's a lot of concern in government as well. And that's why we've uh, done two very major things. One is... Uh, uh, what are the sectors which creates job? I mean, uh, we push for the textile package, of course, but we've done a very unusual thing as far as the construction industry is concerned yes. uh, to revive it and to say that 75% of the uh, um, award money where arbitration award has been given will be paid back. Uh, so these are very uh, unusual things which a government has done to push for job creation in sectors. We've opened up uh, FDI in food so that there can be backward linkage uh, with, uh, we've allowed business to consumers retail so that we can create many more jobs in food processing. So a lot of work has been done. The government is equally, uh, equally, equally uh, concerned about job creation. So we are pushing the limits as far as textiles, food processing, construction, everything is concerned. You know, while you're talking about all of this, and I just want to, I don't want to labor on that, but I want to take this point forward, because even when we were growing at 7.6%, or even if an average of 7%, we're not creating those jobs. Yeah, Shireen, I think we need to look at uh, the present uh, labor statistics as well. Okay. You know, I think if you look at go by EPFO and ESIC statistics, you get a very, very different picture. So you're saying the picture so looks we, we better? Are, we are much, much uh, dramatically better. Uh, than so, what the government uh, yeah, because itself after, is saying. Be, because EPFO and ESIC statistics are actually those of who are getting registered under them. And therefore, we are, we are trying to, we are still at the beginning stage of trying to reanalyze those data and that statistics. So, okay. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Shukla, go ahead. Yeah. He, he addressed that question already. So that's a state issue. If I can get the microphone across here, please. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kant uh, talked about uh, areas of excellence like Bangalore, Chennai, and Pune. 
but for India to progress, we can't have only islands of progress. And our challenge is, you know, how to make uh, Patna the next Pune or Bhuvneshwar, you know, the next Bangalore. And I think competitive federalism, we talk about that it will lift, but I think, you know, there has to be a little bit more, you know, beyond that. And, and maybe Mr. Kalyani can, you know, basically talk about uh, that a little bit uh, as to how do we broad base um, excellence throughout the country. Mr. Kalyani, you want to take up that? You know, the key to getting uh, centers of excellence uh, spread across the country is to connect the country with high-speed networks, yeah. both <coughs> transport as well as communication. If you are able to move from one place to, the, you know, this, this whole uh, road network program that Mr. Gadkari is uh, spearheading or the ports uh, yes. uh, uh, program that, you know, uh, I'll just give you a, a, a simple uh, example or let's say uh, analog. You know, what we are seeing today is a little trickle of activity. You know, it's a little bit like if you're, if you're in Pune and if you're there in, in the early 60s, we had this huge uh, breakage of the Panchet Dam mm. and half of Pune was flooded, uh, you know. But that breakage really started with some few drops coming out of the dam and then a little crack got formed and, and a small uh, uh, water started coming out and then, uh, you know, in a few days, uh, everything burst. Now, I think economy, labor markets, uh, uh, industrialization, uh, manufacturing is pretty much like this. All these policies are uh, creating this little trickle and this little trickle is going to become a little stream and very soon it's going to burst and you know, well, create uh, we a don't, huge uh, opportunity. Unfortunately, we don't really have the luxury of time. Uh, John, yes. Can I, can I add to that? Yes. And, um, you know, in, in the spirit of playmanship, uh, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me give you, if I were in government, actually, I would have a daily subscription to a yoga treatment center because I would really be very stressed. Uh, this is the last... The last time I looked, this is a democracy, and, and you should be extraordinarily proud of that. Uh, and uh, a democracy depends on uh, fueling jobs, uh, and that was absolutely rightly the promise behind Make India, 100 million. Uh, between 2010 and 2014, 4 million manufacturing jobs were created, 4 million. If you extrapolate that at that rate, it is maybe 8, 10 million by 2025. Uh, not nowhere near uh, but what is needed. So yeah. that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. Now, is it possible? No, no, no. Uh, is it possible? I could not agree more. It's absolutely possible. But it's going to be a huge challenge. And for me, that is the biggest single one that I would focus on. The first thing I would begin with, indeed, is to connect the country in every possible way. Uh, because that's, that's an absolute condition uh, to, uh, to become excellent and to really create a massive job uh, machine. And the second one is really become excellent in all the different factors of technology. Yeah. Some are well in place, but many other technologies like, like IoT, right. like artificial intelligence, right. most people don't even begin to understand what it sure. will lead to, will have really a major impact. So uh, focus on that. Uh, and then it will happen. But uh, I, like I said, I would, I would not want to be in government right now. I no, you wouldn't want to be in government, mm. and it's not an easy place to be. Do you have a daily yoga subscription, sir? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I mean, the yoga hasn't done him much good. <laughs> 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 because he's, he's, he's getting his statistics all wrong. Uh, you know, uh, because Make in India was, he's giving, he's quoting statistics from 2010 to 2014, whereas uh, Make in India was launched at, uh, towards the end of 2014. So you, we should really look at but, statistics from the beginning the, of 2015. But, but, no, but, but, no, but Mr. Khan, the problem the, is a real one. No, absolutely. Uh, you, you, know, you, thought, you can no, talk no, about 2014 no, versus 2012 no, and so on and so forth, but the problem is, is real. No, and the fact I, is 100 million and 12 million, there is a significant difference. No, no, I entirely difference. agree with that our key uh, strategy has to be about job creation. You can't do job creation without manufacturing. Yeah. You can't do it on the back of services sector growth, which India has been doing for years. There are huge 
perils of premature deindustrialization. And therefore, you need to push for manufacturing. A large country with a billion population can't grow without manufacturing. You need to do this. And I think one of the, one of the points which uh, Baba talked about is important. And I look at really the end of 2018 as critical because then you, by that time, you'll have the dedicated freight corridor, corridor yeah. which would have connected Delhi to Mumbai. You would have had Chennai to Amritsar to, uh, linked and uh, goods which are taking 14 days to reach the ports in the western coast of India will reach within 14 hours. So that's a dramatic shift. And uh, you know, actually many people don't know, but on the back of the dedicated freight corridor between Delhi and Mumbai, five cities are presently being constructed. Uh, so the, and the, they are at advanced stage. So you will have a lot of new urbanization taking place on the back of that. Okay, we have uh, the last, Please, t t yes, sir. Just one yes, point, go ahead. Uh, you know, to John's uh, issue, Please understand that every direct manufacturing job that gets created creates six indirect jobs. So, you know, you create 10 million jobs in manufacturing, you're really creating 60 million. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the way Indian system works. Okay. Good point. Uh, sorry, I'm just coming uh, to, uh, yes, you've been waiting for a long time. If you can get the mic, go ahead. Sanjeev Rai, I've been itching to make this point. Our top three brands are actually software, mm -hmm. which we are known for globally. Second, entrepreneurship. The US uh, VCA Association statistics is that we are the largest uh, entrepreneur segment, yes. Indians. And third, is that we speak the language of technology, which is English. Now, with artificial intelligence being the central uh, piece of you know, future, these are the most important factors that would combine to make any kind of growth that you can imagine for the sure. future. Okay, thank you very much for that comment, Mr. Forbes. Uh, I'll get the mic across to you and then get in wrap up comments. I'll come to you, sir, in just one second. So I wanted to actually come back to uh, what Amitabh started with, which was uh, the focus on innovation. Uh, and if you, because there's so much potential for Indian companies to do more with innovation and to invest more in innovation and in R&D. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if you look at our proportion of turnover that we invest as Indian companies in R&D, it, it tends to be a much smaller share of turnover than international companies in the same industry segments. Sure. Uh, the most extreme form of that is in the software industry, where our top 10 software firms invest 1% of turnover in R&D. China's top 10 software firms invest 11% in R&D. Whose fault is that? Certainly not his. It's, a, it's definitely not his. I agree entirely. It's part of what we have to do and it's within our control as Indian firms to actually use the opportunities of our low-cost engineering base to invest a lot more in R&D yeah. and to actually build then the, techni the, the technical capabilities that we can then build brands on. Maybe the brand needs to come after the technical capability sure. uh, and not before. So we need to think much more disruptively uh, for India Inc. across sectors. Yes, sir, you've been waiting for a while. I'm going to get the microphone across to you. Go ahead. My name is D.V. Kapoor. Uh, I agree with Mr. Amitabh Khan that we must give a very high target for export. After all, that would be the test of our manufacturing. But why it has not been happening? The answer lies probably in what Baba said, in which he has demonstrated in his company is creation of ecosystem for manufacturing. Mm. And, unfold, and I think what he meant by ecosystem is a manufacturing culture with important components of quality, productivity, yeah. in-house design development. Mm -hmm. And that we have never been focusing perhaps even still not been focusing. Right. Even government is not focusing. In fact, I would go to the extent of saying that even your fraternity, I have rarely heard in a TV interview of like yours and our economic dailies, an article focusing productivity, project management, right design development. We talk of investments, targets, jobs. Those are important. I'm not saying those are not important. But this ecosystem and 
गुड एग्जाम्पल्स आर भारत फोर जन जोकी वी वी टेक योर पॉइंट्स सर एंड नो आई 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 अनफॉर्चूनेटली रनिंग आउट ऑफ़ टाइम आई हैव पीपल इन माय ईयर टेलिंग मी दैट वेर आउट ऑफ़ टाइम सो टेन सेकंड्स प्लीज स्मॉल एग्जांपल व्हिच विल कन्वे माय पॉइंट आवर लार्जेस्ट कमर्शियल एंटिटी इन द कंट्री इज़ रेलवेस वे बन मैन्युफैक्चरिंग कोचेस बेस्ड ऑन एन एक्सेलेंट कोलैबोरेशन डन 50 इयर्स अगो and railways have also been recruiting best of talented engineers yes. electrical and mechanical every year but even recently everybody would knows when we wanted a coach <coughs> capable of running at 160 km only mm. which is not a high speed internationally right we had to import because the ecosystem government has never emphasized on this no. and unfortunately even today that is not happening you are making a very valid point sir thank you very much for 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 raising those very critical issues uh, just just to sort of point out because you talked about uh, the role of the media and i have to say that at least as far as cnbc tv 18 is concerned for 15 years <laughs> we've been putting the spotlight on entrepreneurship uh, every startup that is a startup today has has been uh, on on my show sir so we we've, we've done a little bit to create that No, 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 not not broad words. I, I'll I'll have that conversation with you offline. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm going to now start with wrap up comments from from each of our panelists. Uh, we've talked about need to create an ecosystem. We've talked about the need to create world class brands. We've talked about the need to export more out of India. We've talked about the need for government and the corporate sector to partner and collaborate. Uh, the need for urgent reforms, whether it's land or labour, which of course is not a matter that the centre can do much about. It's a state issue. Uh, on the table from each one of you sanjeev starting with you the three things in the short term medium term and long term that you would like uh, each of these stakeholders to focus on well uh, as far as uh, indian ecosystem is concerned i think for a running business like ours we are already using it and leveraging it right so the important thing is that first part would be that india should start consuming more of high technology in the efficiency and the productivity area but when you allow that then a lot of global technology comes in and that global technology gets indigenized and then gets spread into the supply chain into the sub suppliers that's a that's a quickest way to connect with the global world and also upgrade the skills as well as the sophistication of the supply chain the second part is that if you are talking about mass scale uh, uh, manufacturing jobs i think there are about 30 uh, economies in the world uh, the developed economies their uh, you know the growth rate of their <coughs> Uh, labor force is declining and yeah. in india we will have that dividend going forward for next uh, 15 to 20 years i think we should also have a focus program from the policy point of view to catch those jobs because those will go to the locations wherein you have the labor arbitrage mm -hmm. but at the same time we should combine it with very high quality culture right. if you have a labor arbitrage with combined with high quality culture that's a lethal combination for the country to leverage on to create a very very high uh, you know the mass scale jobs third thing uh, i believe industry 4 i think we should not underestimate what india has we have also you know unskilled and uh, semi skilled people but also we have very good talent with phd's mtechs and the btechs and these are the people who are very technology savvy mm -hmm. they understand technology they talk technology as my, uh, my you know one of the <coughs> members said and and about the industry 4 is nothing but iot industry uh, internet yep. of things then you combine it with services and people then on top of it you have the machine learning which uh, basically learns sure. how to uh, interpret that data and then on top of it is artificial intelligence which allows you to take decisions and this ecosystem actually this whatever we have we may have missed in past i think this industry 4 is, is an something an opportunity where india can take lead because those elements are more soft rather than hard in nature there okay. and that's that's one which can really not only make us very competitive and productive locally when we produce it here and also participate on the global scene because that's where the industry is moving thank you very much uh, sanjeev uh, mr kalyani short term medium term long term three things <coughs> i think short term we need to make sure that whatever india consumes we start producing whether it's defense whether it's railways whether it's energy sector we need to start doing that and i think that's something that just needs to happen asap in the medium term indian industry needs to scale up 
scale up dramatically. Because if you're talking about 25% GDP in 2025, yes. you're talking about uh, from $300 billion of manufactured products to $1.2 trillion, trillion of manufactured yes. products, four times in 10 years. And that's a huge scale up. We just need to create that mindset. And like one of the gentlemen there said, India's brand is entrepreneurship, technology, and I think this is all that's going to come together <clears throat> to make that happen. And third, nobody, I think we didn't talk much about skills mm -hmm. and skilling. I think th there's a lot of work being done, but there is a lot more work that needs to be done in this area, okay. specifically outcome-based, yeah, outcome-based skilling processes. Okay. Thank you very much. John, short-term, medium-term, long-term. The short to midterm, um, I would uh, uh, encourage uh, the government particularly to continue all the great work that it has started, uh, because particularly in the longer history, it's, it's unique what is happening. For the first time, I see the trust really broad-based uh, taking place uh, here, that the country is moving in the right, uh, the right direction. So absolutely continue uh, on the, and all the things that were mentioned here. Uh, in terms of trade negotiations, in terms of uh, further deregulation, etc., uh, should uh, should continue. I have faith that it will. The big question out there is the mid to longer term, mm -hmm. and and there we are beginning to understand that. I would argue, AT Carney is involved together with the World Economic Forum and many companies and institutes around the world to understand what the future shape of production will be for the mid to longer term, um, and it's obviously triggered by a lot of technological developments, some which we know, like robotics, for instance, but some that we are only beginning to understand, artificial intelligence. I'm not even sure we fully yeah. comprehend what, sure. it will, what, it, what, it, what it will be. And um, I would really kindly invite um, uh, certainly companies uh, in, in India and certainly the government in India to participate in that uh, effort, to think that through, to grasp uh, what it means, first of all, uh, and then to translate that into the right policies for this, uh, for this country and for individual companies. Well, thank you very much, John. Mr. Kant, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, you know, we've all heard what needs to be done. The government can do uh, a lot of what is being talked about. So what can we expect in terms of addressing some of these issues in the short term, medium term and long term? You know, firstly, I think uh, Indian industry and Indian entrepreneurship must embrace technology with all its might. You know, we missed out on the industrial revolution. Don't miss out on the intelligent manufacturing revolution. That's critical for India. Just, we, we are uh, very advanced in software and the ability to converge with manufacturing is very, very necessary for India in the years to come. I totally agree with Mr. Kapoor that we need to lay focus on efficiency, productivity, quality. These are very, very critical things if you want to drive manufacturing in the long run. Thirdly, I think innovation and design is the key to India becoming a great manufacturing nation. Indian industry has not been patenting. Only 22% of the patents being registered in India is being done by Indian companies. Indian companies must go all out and do large-scale patenting of what they are doing. And therefore, in the long run, patents are very critical. Fourthly, I think it's important that states become champions of manufacturing. Twelve states driving manufacturing in a big way, uh, unleashing our power you know, by bringing in reforms on labor, land, etc., will enable India to become a great manufacturing nation. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here this, uh, this morning. I think there's a, there's a lot of meat on the table on what needs to be done by government, by industry, separately and together. I think the, the most significant takeaway, perhaps, uh, from the conversation and the dialogue that we've had this morning is that we can achieve that goal of 25% by 2025 in terms of manufacturing output to GDP if we're all talking in the same language, if we're all aligned and working towards the same goal and the same objective, which hasn't been the case in India very often. So hopefully all stakeholders will move in the same direction and that is forward. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on the CNBC TV 18 special discussion. Thanks.